Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Rear Vision Lessons from Community Education in the 80s, Melbourne, Australia, and Michigan, USA, is an historical reflection on community education with its roots in Michigan, USA, and Melbourne, Australia, an example of the school as a community hub, the Princess Hill School Park Centre. My personal narrative describes a history of interaction between the school, the community and local government with its aim to foster place-based community decision-making. It demonstrates the radical moves that were made in the 80s to expand the role of community education from the use of school buildings and facilities to community empowerment. In the context of reviewing the untapped potential of schools as community hubs, the term rear vision springs to mind, reflecting the need to look back to go forward. The experience of community education in the 1980s in Michigan and Melbourne can inform how the school as a community hub can embrace the building of connections and empower communities. The community education movement was founded in Flint, Michigan in the early 1930s in response to the impact of economic decline, resulting in a range of issues including unemployment, crime, youth delinquency and increased community tensions leading to an unstable and unsupported school system. The history of the community education movement provides evidence that broadening the role of schools beyond the use of their buildings and facilities can build connections, participation and resilience in a post-pandemic and increasingly polarised world. This is my story. In 1974, the Parks and Recreation Superintendent of the City of Melbourne set off to Michigan, USA, the birthplace of community education, to research how the City of Melbourne could promote and support the role of the city in recreational activities and the use of the city's parks and gardens. The following year, the Victorian Liberal government, recognising the growing interest in community use of schools, amended the Education 1975 Act, together with the Youth Sport and Recreation Act 1972, and handed schools the power, the power to enter into agreements for the community use of their school buildings and facilities. In that same year, in an inner city suburb of Melbourne, a public meeting of the Princess Hill and Carlton community was held in the Princess Hill High School Theatre. The meeting overwhelmingly supported the establishment of the Princess Hill School Park Centre. It was to be a joint initiative of the Princess Hill High School Council, Princess Hill Primary School Council and the Melbourne City Council. The Education Department seconded a secondary school teacher to the role of director, and the City of Melbourne appointed a centre-based recreation officer. A committee was elected made up of school community representatives, plus nominees from the staff of both the schools and a City Council representative. The establishment of the centre in 1974 reflected the early definition and role of community education, with its focus on community use of school buildings and facilities for adult education and recreation activities. However, the late 70s and early 80s were a time of economic decline, social unrest and political change, and community education increasingly was seen as a means to strengthen, to strengthen community participation in place-based decision-making. In 1978, I was employed by the Princess Hill High School Council as the Princess Hill School Park Centre Community Education Officer. The role was to explore and capitalise on the interface between the school community, the broader community and the city government and develop programs and activities that reflected the interests, issues and needs of the community. The centre was to move from a centre of adult education to a centre that prioritised community outreach, empowerment, and the participation of the community in the schools and the community. In 1983, 
I was keen to explore the role and work of community education in Michigan, USA, and arranged an exchange to the St. Ignace Area Schools District as the community education director. The experience working with community education colleagues from across Michigan, together with projects I established across the consortium of schools, confirmed the move to a broader definition of community education, one that encompassed participatory decision-making across the school and community. For example, I established a community cable television station, St. Ignace Community Television, promoted local football, local arts and local politics, and struck a chord with the locals. Meet the Candidates, held at Big Boy, the family local restaurant, was beamed into every home, resulting in an increased voter turnout. The football achieved similar ratings, and the arts did well too. Returning to Princess Hill School Park Centre in 1984, I continued to work on a range of projects, programs and activities drawing on the support of the school community and responding to their needs and interests. The centre was open to the community seven days a week, providing for the diverse range of community interests and needs from private to public house residents and covering many languages and cultural backgrounds. The City of Melbourne Recreation Officer provided after school and holiday programs and sporting activities, whilst the Council of Adult Education introduced adult education classes of interest to local residents. Community artists were contracted to undertake writing and arts-based activities with residents and local groups to build connections across the diverse community. The centre became a sought after venue for a range of cultural and ethnic groups for regular functions and special events. Building connections across the community became the modus operandi for the centre. Projects and programs covered a wide range of interests and needs as expressed by the school and community and included a production of a locally based and owned community newspaper, City Alternative News, the establishment of the North Carlton Railway Station Neighbourhood House, in a disused railway station, following extensive community lobbying of the Melbourne City Council and the State Government. A community flat for tenants was established as an advocacy and information centre on a nearby Housing Commission estate. A curtain for Carlton mural comprising a tapestry of squares was stitched by local community organisations, groups and agencies and hung in the high school. Before school breakfasts were provided in the high school cafeteria and used as a dining and social venue in the evening by local families. A case for Carlton was published and presented to the Melbourne City Council following extensive community consultation, which provided evidence of the need for improving the planning and delivery of community and childcare services. The establishment of the island as an alternative off-site classroom provided high school students with trade, craft and art schools to complement their time in the normal classroom. A drop-in centre was set up for high school students needing career and further education information and advice. The high level of youth unemployment at this time impacted on local communities, families and of course, young people. Looking back on these examples of community education in action, highlights the role that the school as a community hub can play in building connections and empowering the community. Community education processes and practices can offer insights into how we can build access to decision-making that impacts on the individual and the community. Schools as community hubs can build connections that pivot on the interface between the school community and local government and empower individuals and the community in local decision-making and help to secure our collective future. There is no doubt we will be confronted by future stresses and shocks, be they the result of increasing extreme weather and climate related events, economic downturns, social inequalities or pandemics. As we seek to build our resilience to those challenges, we will need to develop participatory decision-making structures and processes that build connections and confidence 
in our collective futures. Thank you.